Very interesting to me that 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 timing on that a week after I pulled the banner out. So anyway, okay, that's what I got. So we're going to do uh, our message today. We are in the book of Genesis. You know that. We have been going through the flood, the cataclysm, the thing that changed the world in such a way that we can't even comprehend what it was like before the flood. Things have changed so drastically, and there's only hints given in the Bible of just how different the world was back at the time before what we call the flood. And so um, we, we're going to see a few hints today, but again, it's just a couple of hints. And uh, the Lord didn't care to tell us about. We, we know what the world is like now, and but what it was like then, a world that had perfect weather, no need for rain, which means no clouds, no precipitation, the right humidity, the right weather, the right temperature, all those things all the time, literally the paradise that they were able to live in. They, it was such a beautiful climate, they didn't even need clothing. Why do we wear clothing now? Modesty, of course, because we have a fallen nature, but because, because it gets chilly. There's wind or it's, you know, whatever. It's, it's just, why do we have air conditioning? Because it gets warm out, especially if you're in South Florida. Um, so all of that is a reminder of stuff that we, don't, we can't even really comprehend about what things were like before the flood. So today um, we're talking about the event that happened after the flood that kind of always will color our view of Noah just a little bit. Last week we heard the Lord talking about putting a sign in the sky. You know, he hung his bow in the clouds. And that's the rainbow, and it's a promise that he's never again through the waters of a flood going to destroy the earth like he did at that time. And I believe there's promises in there that say he will not ever destroy the earth and start over again, um, you know, until that very time he catches us up to be with him, okay, right, be right preceding that cleansing event or, um, uh, well, I'll, I'm not going to get into end time theology right now, so scratch what I just said, okay, because um, I have to explain that a little bit more, and we don't want to take the time today. Uh, the, uh, so anyway, the world will never be destroyed. He put his bow in the sky. Now, by, no one needed that promise. We, especially in view of what happens in the today. You know, Noah has a major problem in his life. I can imagine the next cloud that showed up on the scene. He'd be thinking, "We weren't told to build an ark this time." You know, I mean, they still had the old ark lying around, but you know, it's it had to be a little bit nerve wracking. Anyway, the. Uh, Message today is based on Genesis chapter 9, verses 18 to 29. I have it entitled, Explaining the Development of Nations. Remember, because that's really what's going on in this particular section of Scripture. We're talking about explaining the de development of nations. And um, it really sh shows us a bit of what was going on. We're going to see the next thing, the same thing in chapter 10, how nations were spreading out around the earth and all, you know, stuff like that. But um, today we're just going to see a little bit about it, one particular branch of the family line after this. So explaining the development of nations, we are in verses 18 and 19 as we start today. It's the bow has been hung in the sky. The sons of Noah... The ones coming out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, were sons of Noah. And from these three, humanity was dispersed throughout the earth. So, we're being told, we're being reminded, we already knew this, we're being reminded every other human being has died. And these three sons of Noah are the ones who now carried on the human race. Notice Noah didn't have any more children. So it's these three, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, who were the ones who 
um, we're going to be bringing forth the rest of the population of the world. Pretty important, guys, and it's important for us to understand how the families grew into the world. By the way, the word order, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, um, Ham is the youngest, it appears pretty clearly. Japheth is probably the oldest, and the reason the word order is this way, there's two reasons probably. Um, in Hebrew, it's very common to say the shorter names first. And then the multi-syllable, okay? So, Shem, Ham, Japheth. Now, try to say that Japheth, Shem, Ham, and you say, oh, that doesn't even make sense because we're so used to Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Japheth. Uh, it just works better. It flows better in Hebrew. And uh, the other reason would be is Shem is the promised line. Okay, they're the line of promise, and so has prominence because of that particular thing. But So we got the sons of Noah. They came out of the ark, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. They're important. And then it says something that's a little odd, because we're not in chapter 10 yet, which talks about the development of the nations and the children born to Japheth and the, the children born to Shem. But all of a sudden, right in the middle of this account, it says, I mean, as it's sharing this, it says, by the way, Ham was the father of Canaan. And you say to yourself, huh, Canaan must be important. Well, you all know Canaan was important, wasn't it? Okay, because that's where Abraham was supposed to go, to the place that was named after this grandson of Noah. Okay, so we got Ham and Canaan, and then we've got the emphasis on these three. I mean... It's obvious when they came out of the ark that these three were going to be the ones that propagated the earth, but it goes out of its way to remind us, hey, these are the three. And by doing that, it reminds us that, yes, everyone did die on the earth during that cataclysm. And secondly, that we need to look at them as our fathers. Every one of us came from one of these three. And probably we have DNA in us from all three of them. That mixing after all these years. So we, we probably could say from Grandpa Shem, Grandpa Ham, and Grandpa Japheth. Okay. So next verses, 20 and 21. Noah began as a man of the ground, so he planted a vineyard. Then he drank from the wine and became intoxicated so that he exposed himself in his tent. This is one of those scriptures. It, it's like the scriptures about David and Bathsheba or some of the other unlovely things that David did or that Abraham did. The Bible does not hide the blemishes of those who are heroes. We start out by learning that Noah was righteous in his generations. He was a man whom God approved. It was the same thing said of Enoch, and Enoch was translated into heaven to be with the Lord. So, I mean, we're talking about someone who was walking closely with the Lord. Noah was selected out of all humanity to bring forth the, or to, to propagate the earth through his children after the flood and to preserve humanity through him. This is a privileged man. This is a man who had God's grace on his life. But he was a human being, which means that he carried around the same thing that we carry about, human flesh and human weaknesses. And so we get this very unflattering picture of Noah as we are in this story. And the development, this story is important because it tells us about some things. The Israelites, Moses wrote this history. And the Israelites were on their way, way to Canaan. So Moses wanted the Israelites to understand that they were going to a land that Noah had spoken about. That a land where the inhabitants had been given, there had been a course and a direction given through Noah. And so we're having the story develop. Uh, man of the ground, one who worked the ground. Now, before the flood, everyone worked the ground. And uh, I actually read some commentators who said, you know, they think it was probably easier to work the ground after the flood. I don't know where they get that idea from, okay? Doesn't make any sense, okay? They think, they think that's part of Lamech's prophecy, you know, he'd give us rest. And, and, you know, I believe that he gave them rest by, after the flood, God opened up the dietary menu, 
and he was, you know, you were able to eat meat, which is a shortcut to calories as opposed to when they had to eat a totally vegetarian diet. But anyway, he worked the ground. That's, by the way, a uh, very important emphasis when you've got a new category. The new category is hunter or shepherd. Okay, those are two new categories about being able to harvest shepherds. You could always do because, you know, you would have had sheep and it would have been for clothing. But now you can eat your animals, a herdsman, whatever. OK, so there's a whole different way to produce nutrition that they did not have before. And so, you know, we're being told that that Noah grew up in a world that herdsmen weren't around and that hunters weren't around. And so he continued being a man of the ground after the flood. And he uh, planted a vineyard. He cultivated a vineyard. Maybe he had some of the vines on the ark. You know, how vin you know they take vines. The way you develop a vineyard is you, you, you can develop vines. And uh, he may have had some cuttings along as he went on to the ark. You just don't know. Anyway, for whatever reason, he was able to develop a vineyard. Now, you need to think about this for a minute. How long does it take for a vineyard to produce grapes so that it might be able to give you enough grapes to produce wine? Yeah, it takes some time. This time has passed, okay? So we have time passing. Of course, that's where Canaan shows up because when they got off the ark, there was no Canaan. And Canaan, when you see the birth order of the children, he is uh, not one of the first ones that Ham had. So you understand, there's some time that has passed between when they left the ark and when the, the, uh, vin the vineyard has developed enough fruit to be made into wine. How long? Don't know. But he cultivated his vineyard, and then he made the wine, and uh, he drank from it, and it overcame him. Um, he fell into a drunken stupor, and I suspect it was unintentional. It might have been the first time he had made wine since the fall, and the wine may have fermented far more quickly in the new environment. And so it may have had more of a kick than what he expected. That would be more in keeping with what we know about his character rather than that he purposely overdrank or carelessly overdrank. Um, it probably was unintentional. And, of course, once you've had too much, you have too much. You, you, now, you're, now your uh, sense of ability to... You know, put on the brakes, the filters are gone. And boy, that's the best stuff you ever tasted, right? I mean, that's what happens when someone starts getting drunk and they drink way too much. Um, by the way, I, I, I mentioned this on Friday night. I want to mention it again. You know, there is an amendment on the Florida ballot, Amendment 3, which is legalizing marijuana or wants to legalize marijuana as a constitutional thing in the state of Florida. One of the arguments you hear people say is, you know, there's alcohol and then there's marijuana, and it seems like they have just about the same impact on people's lives. And the um, right now, the marijuana which is available is it's about 10 times stronger than when most of you were that were teenagers. OK, it's just it is so much more stronger. It, it packs a wallop wallop. And when they when they. They, they are doing the studies which point out that there is a level of psychosis that happens in people who are using that stronger version of marijuana. Long-term use can create psychosis. Another name for psychosis is demonic possession. Right. And so, and, and here's, that alerted me to something that I really needed to think through. And so now I realize when someone equates marijuana to alcohol, I've got a response. And the response is this, alcohol is something which comes from the food of the ground and it is produced and it is mentioned in the Bible in even a positive way. It is, it's the abuse of alcohol that is condemned. But it can be mentioned, it has been mentioned, it is mentioned in many different places. As a, in a positive way, Jesus was called uh, basically an alcoholic because he drank wine. 
And um, so we got positive examples of the appropriate moderate use of alcohol. However, every reference to drugs is negative. Okay, and it, it's uh, especially in the New Testament, we have pharmakia, which is a form of witchcraft, and then there is uh, a different form of that word, which is used in the book of Revelation, which I translate pharmaceutical witchcraft. Pharmaceuticals can open the door to the spirit realm, and they were used for witchcraft. Now, I'm not telling you not to use prescription drugs, okay? I don't think anyone has ever opened the door to the demonic realm by using antibiotics, right? Okay, so it just doesn't happen. However, there are certainly drugs, psychotropics, and different things that need to be very, very carefully controlled. By the way, I think that psychotropic drugs, some of them are able to control the uh, demonic problems people can have by shutting that door somewhat, blocking the door somehow. I'm not quite certain how it works. But if, the, if, if drugs can open the door, it would make sense that they can. Another drug might be able to shut the door. And uh, we would rather just use the power of the kingdom of God to be able to do it. So I, I believe that um, I can no longer hear someone say, you know, people can just choose their, uh, you know, stimulant because um, it, it's, there's, there's a world of difference. Okay? And I, I'm well aware of the pharmaceutical, what the Bible says about pharma pharmacia. And, of course, we get the word pharmacy from pharmacia. And it's talking about the type of drugs. Again, not everything you buy at a pharmacy is under pharmaceutical witchcraft or pharma, you know, pharmacological witchcraft. Um, but it is certainly something that we need to be aware of if it's psychotropic or something like that. Um, and again, I, I'm not telling people don't use, if you've got issues, don't use those things. I'm simply saying pray and ask the Lord. I mean, I, I may look like I'm a doctor and my last name would be wonderful. Dr. Cutter only could have been a surgeon with a name like that. Okay, but anyway. Um, so anyway, I believe it was unintentional, probably brought some vines along, and it was a little bit stronger than what he expected because of the change in the atmosphere and the environment. Verse 22, now Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and revealed it to his two brothers who were outside. This is so brief. Yeah, there's, you know, there are all sorts of ideas. There are people who will say, based upon this verse, that Ham must have went in and took advantage of his father sexually. That is so far outside the realm. So the Hebrew is not that subtle. I mean, the Hebrew writers, Moses, everything, it's not. This is what happened is what happened. It says what happened. Okay, we just look at the text and you say, I don't need to read any more into it, although people do. And uh, it, it's just, it's pretty simple. Um, before we get into that, notice again, Ham, the father of Canaan. So it's brought up again that this is an important connection. All I can imagine is that Canaan is probably involved in some way. Why were none of the other children mentioned as Noah deals with the aftermath of this thing, and he actually releases a curse on Canaan and his uh, descendants. Uh, why, why focus on Canaan unless there was some level of involvement? It would make sense to me that Ham and Canaan were together and that Ham led the way in mocking his father and Canaan was there agreeing. That would make sense to me. I think that's, there's a connection. There's something going on which is not highlighted at a very high level. So, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father. So he went into the tent, and this was inappropriate. That this, this, he, he should have seen this and, and do what a, 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 and a, a person who honors his father or mother would do is to look away and do everything that he can do to cover his father, who is in a compromised position. Okay? Um, I think of the people who grow up with uh, alcoholic parents, and they grow into people who kind of cover their parents automatically. 
You cover your parents. And so you do what you can to make sure that the outside, they aren't exposed to the outside world. That I'm not saying that's right for everyone to do that, but I am saying that, that you know, because there would be situations where there's abuse and stuff like that. You, you know, you need, to, you need to get out of it. But um, the, uh, in this particular situation, they, they, they saw him in his tent uncovered, and then he uncovered him to his brothers. That's the problem. Instead of covering it, instead of taking care of it, he uncovered Noah to his brothers. And you can imagine it was in some level of mockery. Because that's why otherwise, hey, you know what I just saw? And, you know, he may have been jesting about it. Cain may, Canaan may have been jesting with him because, again, Canaan's involved somehow, has to be, in my opinion. And so he's uncovering. He's supposed to cover physically and, you know, uh, or literally and uh, figuratively, okay? He's, he's supposed to cover his father. And uh, rather than covering him, he goes out and he shares this, you know what I just saw, and dishonors his father. And it's clearly dishonoring his father. And we can see from the example of Shem and Japheth the way it should have been done. And by the way, that's, the picture, that's how we know nothing more happened. Shem and Japheth, what they did is highlighted as the right thing to do. And Ham did it. The, the, the did the wrong thing. The the opposites of what they did. Um, so we can see. It says, but Shem and Japheth took a coat, and both of them arranged it on their shoulders. Then they walked backwards and covered their fathers naked. Them both of them turned their faces away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. So they said, "We've got to help our dad," and so they took a cloak and they hung it between their shoulders, and they walk backwards. You imagine how difficult that is? Okay? You walk backwards, and until what they probably saw his feet or his head, I don't know, whatever, you know, sticking out the bottom of the cloak, depending on the way that he was lying in there. And when they did, they put the cloak down, and they covered their father. Tremendous honor being presented right here. They they uh, show respect and honor. So they, they did that coat thing. They walked backwards. It's just a, it's going out of their way to make sure that they honored their father. It's, you know, that's, that's pretty good. And they covered him. And, you know, when they covered him, they didn't go out and tell everyone about it either. Because people who honor their parents don't do that. People who honor anyone don't do that. We cover each other. Our love covers a multitude of sins. And what we do is we cover each other in front of everyone else. When someone in our congregation has a fall of some type, you'll never know it. Unless it impacts the congregation. And the reason is love covers a multitude of sins. There's no reason to bring that before the congregation. It's repentance, is, it's over, and it's covered, and it's what we do, and we, we, we look away, and we don't talk about it, and we don't say, because here's, here's the issue. There but for the grace of God go I. All of us have this same fleshy stuff. And it's only by grace that we haven't fallen into some horrible depravities. And so we just say, okay, yeah, that's, that's unfortunate, but we're going to, uh, you know, receive the repentance and trust that the Lord's going to heal everything. And, of course, there's more to it than that. But it's, it's uh, you know, there's, it, it's, it's a way that we cover each other. These guys did it right, okay? They covered. They covered from the very beginning. They didn't use it as a jesting point. They didn't use it for gossip. They didn't use it for any of those things. They simply said, we're going to cover. And that's what we need to do for each other. But especially our parents, we do that as much as we can. Uh, by the way, and that's a, that's a good quick excursus point, because a lot of times people get bitter at their parents. And that's all they ever talk about is how badly their parents treated them. There's only one person that's going to hurt. It's not going to hurt the parents, especially if they were deceased. It's going to just hurt the person sharing the story. Because, uh, you know, the fourth commandment comes with a promise. 
honor your father and mother that it may be well with you and you may live a long life on the earth. That is a promise that God has given. And so if we hear that promise, we say, okay, this needs to be our default for our parents, covering them as much as we can. And so, um, you know, especially if they're getting elderly and there starts to be areas of weakness which, dis- di- which, which presents themselves, you know, you don't focus on the area of weakness. You, you remember the good times. You remember the times when they weren't like that, if their personality has taken a change or whatever, and you honor them for what was, not what's now. And you cover what is now if they have frailty and weakness, which is being shown personality-wise. So next verse, verses... Uh, chapter 9, verses 24 to 25. When Noah woke up from the effects of his wine and recognized what his youngest son had done to him, he said, may Canaan be cursed. He shall be a servant of the lowest stature to his brothers. Okay, that's a... Now, by the way, isn't this a little jarring? When he found out what his youngest son... Who's his youngest son? Well, that's Ham. That's Ham. So when he found out what his youngest son had done to him, he curses his grandson. That's like, what? (laughs) That doesn't even make sense unless Canaan was involved in some way. And uh, it would be be odd otherwise, in my opinion. We may find out more when we are with the Lord. and He's explaining all the scriptures and history to us, but I think right now that's a pretty safe position to have. So he woke up from the effects of the wine. He recovered. And, uh, you know, wine acts as a soporific or, you know, when you drink too much, it's easy to fall asleep. And he was in a drunken stupor and then he finally woke up and he got out from under the effects. And then he was he recognized what Ham had done. And uh, someone told it to him. You know, someone said, this is what Ham did and this is what, um, you know, your other sons did. Someone who was witnessing outside the tent what had happened. Uh, Remember, by this time, there was probably... Kids and grandkids, and I mean, there was a lot of humanity after three or four years, babies anyway, and well, older children at some levels. Some time has passed, but um, so then he he says, uh, he curses a portion of Ham's descendants, which is Canaan, and he calls him a slave of slaves, which is usually the Hebrew way of saying a slave, you know, the lowest of slaves or servants. You know, because in that, remember, in ancient culture, slavery doesn't ha- didn't have the context or the overtones that it does because of the uh, pre-Civil War of the United States, in the United St- pre-Civil War culture. And so we have a lot more... Uh, uh, it has it has a lot worse taste in our mouth than it would have for them because it was just a fact of life in that time. There were there were people who were slaves who were running households and nations. Even I mean, it was just the way it was. It was you may be talking to a slave, but actually have to obey what they say because they're some ruler's slave, and you know all of that. So don't get into the mindset like we have. Um, it was a different world at that time, but still it works best to say the lowest of servants simply because it's hard for us to get past that. So he says, hey, Canaan, you are going to be the lowest of servants um, to your brothers. And that's like, wow, where did that come from? Okay, Now, a couple of things. Noah's words had power. Okay? When Jacob was on his bed prophesying the future of his son, he was setting the course of their future. Always speak positively about your children because your words have power. You brought them forth into this world. Your words have power whether they hear it or not. You are speaking things into existence over them. Speak good things. There's enough bad stuff in the world. 
don't forecast a life that they have to break out of because it's a you know it's a direction i i think every even every parent that has done that wrong thing god there's always grace there for someone to rise above that but it adds a yoke that has to be broken to their life so be very aware that your words have power over your children um then noah said he also said may yahweh the god of shem be praised and let canaan be a servant to them May God provide ample space for Japheth. May he reside in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be a servant to them. So Cain, Cain, uh, Canaan's being a servant to everyone. To God and Shem, you know, may God be praised. And may, you know, the them at the end of that sentence is talking about God and Shem. And then it says, hey, and by the way, let... Uh, Shem, uh, Canaan also served Shem and Japheth as Japheth resides in the tents of Shem. And so this is a pretty comprehensive little destiny setter. Um, he's blessing the two brothers that covered him, thus letting us know how important it was that they did cover him. And is uh, Shem's blessing is there's a close connection to Yahweh. Now, Shem is the father of the Israelites. Abraham is the father of the Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but it's from his line. And so there's a promise already that they will be really connected to Yahweh. Well, how connected were they? Well, they had his temple and he dwelt in it. They had his tabernacle and he was there. They had the ability to communicate him through the, with him through the Urim and Thummim, and the ephod. I mean, they, there was a whole lot of promise that came to the Shemites and to the Israelites as we as that line comes down to become the uh, a part of the Abrahamic covenant. So Shem's blessing would be that he'd be connected closely to Yahweh. Japheth's blessing is that he'd be connected closely to Shem. That's interesting. We'll get into that in just a minute. Um, and then uh, Canaan would be serving them both. Okay, let's look at a little map because we need to understand some things. It says that Canaan is cursed. Well, you know where the land of Canaan is, right? Okay. The land of Canaan, and if you see on this map, it says there were the Zemurites, the Arvidites, the Hamathites, the Sinites, the Archites, the, the it doesn't say the Sidonites, but anyway, Sidon. The Hivites, the Girgashites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites. And I think I have that translated a little bit differently. Uh, I didn't like all the ites. I would probably translate the people of, you know. Okay, anyway. Um, and then there were the Canaanites, the people of Canaan who were there also. That area is the area primarily settled by the people of or Canaan's descendants. What a coincidence. Where was Israel supposed to go? There. What were they supposed to do with those people? Drive them out. Kill them. Say, you know, they're, they're, the cup of their iniquity had reached its full. And so Israel was supposed to march in. And so why was Moses emphasizing Canaan's position because Moses was saying this is right based upon Noah's word, the progenitor, the person who brought forth the new world. And so the whole area of Canaan. Now, in that scripture, it talked about the, the Japh Japhethites, Japh the descendants of Japheth, who would also dwell in the tents of Shem. A couple of things happen. Uh, first of all, if you look over to the west, you see the descendants of Japheth more. And uh, the descendants of Japheth were the Sea Peoples. Some of you have had history classes. And so when I said the Sea Peoples, you said, oh, the Sea Peoples. Who were they? They were the ones that invaded Canaan at the coastline and became the Philistines. The Sea Peoples came in. And the Sea Peoples started to eat away at the... Canaanite land, and then so did the Shemites. 
So the Japhethites and the Semites both were coming in and dealing with the Canaanites and making them slaves and servants. And you say, well, what, wait a minute. The Israelites are supposed to destroy them. Oh, yeah, the Gibeonites became slaves and woodcutters in Israel. And so there was always that type of, you read you know, how David dealt with things or how the Israelites dealt with things. They often impressed people um, who were beyond the boundaries of Canaan, who would also, of course, were, were descendants of Canaan, but not in the groups that were supposed to be. And then when it says that Japheth would dwell in the tents of Shem, all I can think about is the fact that Paul's missionary journeys were to Japhethites. Okay, that's the Greeks and that whole area of Europe. And so when the fullness of time had come and the Messiah was brought, brought into the world, the first missionary journeys went to the descendants of Japheth. That's pretty powerful. Okay, It didn't go down to the descendants of Ham, who were the Egyptians. It went up to the Japhethites. It eventually got down there, but it, it certainly... And then if you look at the world today, um, for centuries, Europe was Christian. And what happened to the area of the Hamites? It was Islam, you know, starting in what was it, the 8th century, 700, 600 in there is when, whenever Mohammed was, was uh, around doing his conquests. And then, be, uh, then after that, they became more and more Islamic. Well, the Japhethites became more and more Christian. And, of course, Western Europe uh, is still, you know, a result of that. Um, and, I mean, long ago they abandoned a lot, you know, long ago meaning in the 50s, the 40s, the 30s, they started to have a form of godliness but were denying its power. In the same way that in the United States today we're going through that same process and we're praying for revival to reverse it. So, tells you a little bit more about what it was that was being focused on. So we got this little vignette, we got this little thing that's being focused pointed out to us and this thing that is being pointed out to us is Noah gets up and he sets the course of a family line based upon something that they did they did not honor their father and so Ham was cursed because any parent that sees a curse settling on their child is going to be experiencing a curse and is going to feel it and then Canaan his course, at least at some level, was set as a nation. And that doesn't mean individuals couldn't rise above the curse and step out and go after Yahweh. But it does mean, and I probably Melchizedek is one of them, but it does mean that eventually there was going to be impact as a result of what Noah had done. Now, by the way, all of this cataclysm story, all of the flood story, all of the stuff we've gone through, it's really an interruption in the genealogies. Remember how we did chapter 5? So-and-so, you know, lived so many years, begot children, blah, 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 and then he died, and then he died, and then he died. Okay, we're going to end. We're, this is exactly what's going on with Noah yet. We've gotten to the end of the stories that are important about Noah, and so we're given his epilogue. This is his epilogue. Then Noah lived 350 years after the cataclysm. In total, the days of Noah were 950 years, but then he died. So we've got the same familiar formula that we had in chapter 5, and uh, Noah lived 350 years after the cataclysm. And he lived to the ripe old age of 950 years. You know, I, you know when I, I just want you to think about this. Yeah, just a kid. Um, we're talking just a bit ago about Olga, who at 90 years old was coming out to work at an early voting site and was looking forward to it at 92 years old this time around. And you think to yourself... Wow, we're going, that's amazing. 950 years. Remember, he didn't even start working on the ark until he was 500. 
What a difference. You know, and the, the pre-flood world had something going on in it that kept people healthy. The post-flood world, we start seeing the ages just drop precipitously, still longer. I mean, they were living 120, 140 years. But then, you know, as we see world history, we know that in world history, that, that was something that disappeared pretty quickly. And, you know, people died a lot younger than we die today because of the disease and everything that was around. But this is pretty impressive for Noah, 950 years after the cataclysm. You know how many generations he was able to live and see? That's amazing. A lot of his generations were able to meet him if they were so inclined. But then he died, and he is a bar- part of the great cloud of witnesses. And I would expect him to be an honored part of the great cloud of witnesses. And I think it's going to be incredible when we meet him. But the truth is, I think it's going to be incredible when we meet everyone in heaven. You know, one of the little things, and I, I know I'm jumping way ahead, but remember when Lot, Lot was a, he's not portrayed real nicely in Scripture, right? He's just not. And then you read about him in the book of James, and James says, this righteous man, he calls him a righteous man because James understood more about his life than we know. We just heard about the negative things about Lot, but James knew some of the things that Lot did that blessed his culture. And as a result, he calls him a righteous man whose the, the sin of the people around him grieved his heart, grieved his soul. And I think, you know what? When we meet Lot, we're going to be amazed. When we meet Lot in heaven, we're going to be honoring him in ways we can't even begin to imagine just simply because, and I think that's the way we're going to be with every saint in heaven, with everybody, because we're going to see what God did in their lives in spite of whatever difficulties or whatever thing that they faced while they were on this earth. And as we look at Noah's life, we see a really not-so-happy moment in his life, which Scripture does not gloss over. It demonstrates to us this thing, this blemish in his life, so we will realize that he was a human being just like us and also so we'd realize the subsequent development of nations but doesn't it give hope for you because you all have stories of victory we all do we all have stories of overcoming and those are going to be the things that by the power of god's grace is going to be focused on As we spend all eternity and you know why eternity is going to go on and on and on because we all have so many stories And we're going to get to hear them in between our times of just looking at God and going, you did this in their life. You are so worthy of praise. I mean, that's that's this development of the bride of Christ. And there's going to be billions of us there telling our stories. And I think we're going to hear story after story after story. And it's not going to be like today where you can hear the same stories over and over and over again. I don't think so. I think we're going to hear amazing things as we stand before the throne of the Lamb and meet Noah. Wow. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity today to be able to study about the life of your amazing saint named Noah. Lord, I I suspect Shem, Ham, and Japheth are going to be people that we meet in heaven, and we are absolutely amazed by, even though Ham isn't presented in a good light, Um, I'm asking, Lord, that you would help us to live up to our potential in spite of whatever it is that we've had happen in our past. I ask that we would rise above and that we'd be able to honor you in every way with our lives. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen.